Welcome to the Dr. Diamond Podcast, where doctors learn from industry experts proven methods to grow their practices like the top 1%. And now your hosts, president of OfficeAutomated.com, Robert Barton, and the CEO of New Patient Group, founder of the Dr. Diamond Club, national keynote speaker, and featured in Dental Economics, Forbes, and CNBC, Brian Wright. Welcome back to the Dr. Diamond Podcast. This is episode number two. Uh, Here today, we have Dr. Regina Blevins, and we're going to be talking about the future of orthodontics. And Dr. Blevins is a client of Brian and, and his company, New Patient Group. And he knows her a lot better than I do. So I'm going to let him take it away and look forward to the content today. Yeah, I appreciate that intro, Robert. And, you know, we have an exciting podcast today, The Future of Orthodontics, and bringing in somebody that is uh, as renowned as Dr. Blevins uh, means the world to us. And, uh, you know, she's also a client of New Patient Group. So it means a lot. She's coming aboard as the lead clinical advisor of the Dr. Diamond Club we have a great relationship. And just for the listeners out there, Dr. Blevins, the owner of Minnesota Orthodontics, uh, she has multiple locations and is growing faster than what she'll, she'll tell you she might even be able to handle. They're having enormous success. Uh, she's currently the leading Invisalign teen producer in the world, uh, an aligned faculty speaker, and also, like I said, the lead clinical advisor of the Dr. Diamond Club. So welcome in, Dr. Blevins. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm surviving the Minnesota bitter cold right now, but uh, but doing well. Um, as you know, at the end of uh, the year, is very busy in an orthodontic practice. So uh, we we uh, had a very busy day today. Yep, busy is good. And how cold is it there right now? Um, minus uh, seven or eight, I think. Oh my gosh, minus seven or eight. And then yesterday in Houston, we were worried about the 45 degree temperatures. So, Oh, you're a lightweight. <laughs> well, let's get into it. So I know the listeners are going to be excited to hear from you. Why don't we start off and just tell us more about yourself, uh, you know, your background and some of the things that you attribute your, your success to. Well, I, uh, I've been in dentistry since I was 16 years old. I started at uh, on the job trained dental assistant and uh, went to dental hygiene school from there. Uh, then on to uh, dental school at the University of uh, Michigan and orthodontic school at the University of Minnesota. So I've seen every uh, aspect of how a practice runs, um, including covering maternity leaves for front desk people. So uh, I have a unique perspective on uh, the ins and outs of an office and and uh, how the inner workings uh, happen. So uh, I've seen it all, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And I've seen uh, in the last 25 or 26 years how dramatically uh, dentistry has changed from uh, hand dipping uh, x-rays to uh, CBCTs and, and the like. But uh, I would say the thing that uh, I attribute my success to mostly is uh, I'm persistent and I'm not afraid of change. Um, I I tend to uh, step back, evaluate it. And if I think it's a good thing, uh, then I embrace it. Um, So uh, I I would say it's persistence uh, above all else. Uh, uh, Problem solving and, and figuring out how to get something done. Yeah, that's all really impressive. And I know having you been a, you know, a client of new patient group now for a while, you know, one of the things I appreciate about you and our team does too, is just, I mean, no matter how successful you are, you're willing to listen and talk a little bit more, you know, just briefly to the listeners out there that how important it is that no matter how successful you are, you know, still take advice, still always trying to reach the next level, no matter how great you are. I think that's a great, uh, you know, great trait that you have that, that not many have, frankly. Well, um, there's a quote that someone uh, told me that I like to use in some of my lectures, and that is the most uh, expensive uh, thought is we've always done it this way. Um, (laughs) Because if you're closed minded uh, to innovation, uh, you're never going to see how something might be done better or easier or more profitable. Um, And I I think that's a real stumbling block uh, for some of today's doctors because um, change can be um, uncomfortable uh, at first. 
And then uh, before you know it, uh, the change becomes uh, the norm and you wonder how you ever did it that way. Before. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's a great point. You could, whether that's in the clinical world or life in general, that, that couldn't be, that couldn't be more spot on. And I mean, I think that leads us right in today, you know, with all the change going on in dentistry, orthodontics, et cetera, you know, the consumer is really taking orthodontics and just the whole dental profession down a path uh, that's really requiring a different skill set from whether how you run your business, how the staff operates, et cetera. And I know you know that. And because today's topic is about the future of orthodontics, you know, let's start off by talking about clear aligners and, you know, what the consumer wants. And do you believe that, that clear aligners are the you know, where are they headed? Are, are they the way of the future? What, what are your thoughts there? Well, um, I kind of have a, a little bit of a chuckle here and a tongue-in-cheek answer uh, because people often ask me if aligners are the future, and I'll say no, and they'll look at me kind of oddly because uh, they don't expect the next thing I'm going to say, uh, and that is they're not the future, they're the now. Um, because the, the consumers already spoken, uh, it's what they want and they want it faster, more comfortable and, uh, more cost effective. And we as a profession, uh, need to listen to, uh, the consumers and, um, try to embrace that, uh, because clear aligners, if you haven't mastered uh, basic treatments with them, yet you're already behind. Interesting. And I mean, that's <laughs> because consumers are on the go. I mean, one of the great things, at least I feel, that clear aligners are, are able to do for an orthodontic practice, especially a busy one you know, like yourself, is, is it lessens the amount of appointment times your, your clientele, your patients need you know, to come in and see you. And it's it's not to hurt a doctor's feelings. You know, consumers are on a go and they just don't want to come in uh, as much as they may it, it may have in the past with braces or just maybe a slower way of life, how consumers used to live. And maybe go into that. I mean, what are some of the ways that you handle your, uh, you know, your Invisalign appointments? How often do patients see you? And, and tell the listeners out there how you feel about all of that and what they should be doing. Well, there's a whole spectrum of, of new kinds of patients. There's patients that just want to know uh, if you if you can be if they can be treated and maybe how much and uh, those kind of patients we've adopted uh, kind of a virtual sort of exam where they'll come in and they'll meet with a treatment coordinator who will look at them and talk with them and see what their goals are and even give them a ballpark a range on a fee so that a valuable new patient consultation time isn't used with patients that are just in that kind of shopping or maybe budget planning stage. Sure. Um, so uh, in, in a respect for their time, we can get them in and maybe in a 20, 30 minute non-doctor time when I am maybe at a different office and answer some of those fundamental questions. Um, yes, they are a candidate. Um, uh, and here's a range of fees, maybe uh, $5,000 or, or $6,200 or whatever that might be. But at least it gets them into the office. Uh, we can make those appointments usually uh, the day they call or, or the next day. And it's very important. The consumer wants to know that information now. And we don't really want to give it over the phone because we want to build that relationship of them actually kind of seeing our physical plant, meeting um, a treatment coordinator and things like that. So that's one innovation that we've done. Um, another one is a same day consultation. If they're ready to start and they want to see a doctor, uh, we try to take all the records that very first appointment. Even before I see them, they've had their scan. They've had their photos. Um, we ask them to please bring any current x-rays with them. And if they don't have them, we plan to take them that same day. So when they are done, we're ready to go. Um, we don't need a second appointment to discuss finances. We don't need a second appointment to uh, discuss treatment. Uh, unless it's a very complicated case, we can usually get everything uh, handled in that first appointment. 
And Dr. Blevins, I have a question concerning that. How long have you done it that way? Was that, you know, did you start that early in your Around practice? Around 2015. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's fairly new. Up until then, we would at least do um, the records and then uh, a start, uh, you know, maybe a couple weeks later. Okay. But we're ready to sign the contract and with a digital scanner. Um, and we're doing indirect bondings or we're doing Invisalign, we're having them make the commitment that day so we can start processing their case. Um, and then we have a, a software on the computer that draws up the contract, puts the numbers in, and uh, if they're ready to commit, we're ready to start that same day. You know, that, that's one thing that I think that's among many others that you do that I see because, I mean, we have the luxury of seeing a lot of practices, obviously, and the ones that, I mean, it's kind of sales fundamental 101. I mean, every time in the sales world, every additional appointment you have in many respects lessens the chance that you're going to close that individual really regardless of the type of business you have. And in orthodontics, it's no different. If you don't have your system in place set up, to close that consumer day one, you're giving other orthodontists or even GPs for that matter that do Invisalign because a lot of times the consumers don't know the difference. Uh, you're giving other ones a, a bigger chance to close them if they go to two, three, four for, for second, third, and fourth opinions. So you've got to be ready day one. And I see that as something that sets you apart from, from a lot of people because a lot of doctors, uh, they don't want to do it that way. They still want to do the, you know, the two, three, four consult approach and just talk briefly about why that does not work anymore. Well, first of all, uh, parents and, and, you know, adult patients or parents of, of kids and even the kids themselves, they're busy. So they, believe it or not, see coming in as an inconvenience. So the more times they have to come in, you're already kind of, uh, you know, setting up a little bit of what I call bad juju. Okay. So <laughs> if, if they come in, and and you explain things and you show them the records, you show them the value of why they need treatment. And, uh, you know, most of today's consumers are purchase now people. Yep. And uh, if you uh, accommodate that, they're very thankful. And uh, many times they've come in saying we've got three consultations set up. And by the end of their 45-minute appointment, they're, they're ready to sign, they start their treatment, and they don't even go to the other two. No, that's really good stuff. And I mean, that, I mean, I think if a lot of doctors take that advice and they just, they just shrunk their two, three, four consult approach to one, and I know you and I have had many offline discussions about this. I mean, just one, one appointment in itself is going to grow your practice. So that's awesome you do that. And that leads us into... You know, we're talking about consumers, the future of orthodontics, and you know, there's a lot of companies out there popping up that, you know, take the approach that, uh, and, and these companies do well, that take the approach that not all consumers are searching for comprehensive treatment. They may be okay with what an orthodontist wouldn't be okay with, but, you know, and again, the consumer is the one dictating the marketplace. So, you know, because not all consumers are searching for that comprehensive treatment, I really think it and I want you to elaborate on this, of course, but it really creates a wonderful opportunity for the practices that are willing to, you know, do a little bit lesser of treatment, quote unquote, uh, to meet what the consumer wants and maybe charge a lower fee for it. If you could go into more depth about how you handle that and, and your thoughts on that. Well, you know, um, I'm no different than uh, most orthodontists out there. We were trained to, um, to do comprehensive treatment. To, to put our very best out there. Um, but the consumer has spoken and they don't always want to, to do that. Um, a time investment, maybe they don't want to spend the time. Uh, financial investment, maybe they can't or are unwilling to pay for that. Um, my litmus test uh, personally is if they want an enhancement and I think that's going to better their health and not hurt them, then I've made peace with being able to offer some limited treatments. Um, and I'm finding that uh, probably the, the biggest uh, area of patients that I'm finding that with is the parents in the practice already. 
because they already uh, have faith in our office. Uh, we're treating uh, their children and they may have already had comprehensive orthodontic care and they just want a little touch up, but they're almost afraid to broach the subject because they think that it's going to be two years and five or six thousand dollars. Right. Okay. And uh, also there are patients out there that um, aren't having any functional problems with their bite. They're not having TMJ disorder. They're not having any problems eating, but they would like to look better. And um, I think there's a place for offering um, some kind of uh, services like that. And, uh, you know, there are companies out there that are already doing it. And uh, I rather see an orthodontist who's been trained, uh, who's certainly going to, you know, watch and try not to do any harm, uh, being the one spearheading that. That's interesting stuff. So, I mean, long story short, you, you're willing to, to treat those people as long as you think it doesn't put them in additional uh, clinical jeopardy, I guess is yes, maybe the best way. Yes, it's not going to make their situation worsen or deteriorate, and we're going to tr- make them uh, better. Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, those cases that we do do like that, we will keep it open-ended and say, when these goals are met and we've satisfied this relationship with you, our doors are open if you want any further treatment in the future. Now, of course, that's going to come at additional fee right. and additional time. But, you know, how many other uh, practitioners in the medical field uh, are like that? You know, you, you they don't always treat everything to perfection. We do what we can. No, I think that's a great point. And I mean, again, the consumer in the end, the consumer is, is going to, they're going to say what they want. And, you know, I think there's some doctors that are going to stick to how they were taught in the beginning. But I think ones like you that are willing to, you know, make the adjustment to what the consumer is saying they want, as long as you're not putting them in clinical now, jeopardy, you know, are going to yes. come out ahead. Yeah, don't get me wrong. All with informed consent. This is, this is what I would recommend ideally. These are the risks. These are the benefits of uh, comprehensive treatment versus limited treatment, and they make a choice in what they're going to what they're going to do. That's important because I think a lot of doctors out there may or may not do that. So you know, ensure you're saying make sure that if you do what we're talking about, and you treat a patient maybe not in the fullest extent that you otherwise may want to clinically, that they need to not only be educated but they need to sign something that basically is agreeing that you've talked to them about that. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. That it's a limited treatment, that that benefits and risks have been gone over, and that uh, uh, if they change their mind and they want comprehensive treatment, uh, this is the situation. Uh, you know, it's going to be an additional fee, how much that additional fee is going to be and how much longer it's going to take. Well, that's really good stuff, Dr. Blevins. And let's talk about, you know, just how long do you let patients go in between uh, appointment times when they're in treatment? Uh, You know, consumers are, again, on the go. So how do you handle all that? Historically, um, uh, orthodontists used to see patients every month, okay? And um, I chuckle a little bit about that because it wasn't based so much on biology, of what we needed to do, but that people were on a monthly payment plan. Okay. Okay. So you have, and there are still orthodontists that, that embrace that. So you have to let go of the idea of the appointment tied to the uh, monthly payment. So uh, if patients are put on um, appointment um, uh, sequences, it has to be divorced from the payment plan. Okay, they may have a monthly payment that they make and they're on auto pay or however your office sets it up. But their appointment intervals, even for fixed, can be uh, eight, 10, 12 weeks apart, depending on what phase of treatment, like the initial unraveling of a case. Mm -hmm. Maybe you only need to see them uh, in 12 weeks. Invisalign's classic that way because you can map out Uh, with when the IPR is going to be and things like that, exactly how often you'll need to see the patient. Uh, 
Now, younger ones I see on 10 week intervals because they've got eruption happening and things like that. Mm -hmm. But my adult patients, I can stretch their appointments between aligners uh, appointments to as much as 20 weeks. Wow, 20 weeks. Very that's, successfully. Uh, and you know what? You, I laugh about you saying they don't want to see you and it shouldn't hurt your feelings. Because <laughs> to tell you the truth, at first it hurt my feelings. Because <laughs> they come in and they would say, oh, well, can I come in in uh, 28 weeks instead of 20 weeks? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, but you've gotten over that now. It doesn't hurt you anymore, right? No, it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. (laughs) And the other thing I found that, you know, when we started going to these things, there's some reluctance that are they going to continue to pay? And they do. Consumers today are used to monthly payments. Okay. So uh, you certainly, if you set them up on an auto pay or something like that, uh, they, it just comes out of their monthly budget and they, they just come see you when you tell them and it's a completely separate entity. Well, I'm glad to hear you say consumers are used to monthly payments because that's about how 85 to 90% of all consumers make, make purchasing decisions as if that monthly payment is low enough to fit in their budget. And I, I see so many doctors, uh, like you said, they tie the appointment with the monthly in-house payment as an example. And having been in plastic surgery for so many years where the default rate on payments was very high, now being in dentistry and orthodontics for so many years, the default on on in-house payments and just payments overall is very low. So it's something that I completely agree with you about that, that doctors out there need to let go of that tying the appointment to that payment for that for that particular month. And I mean, what you just described, Dr. Blevins, I mean, we all know, you know, the fee, the, the lab fee that comes with Invisalign. And there's a lot of talk about that, whether, you know, be an orthodontist doing Invisalign or a GP that does it. But you just described a great way to instantly become more profitable because every, every appointment less that that patient needs to come in, you're making more money when you do a case. T- talk a little bit more about the profitability side of it. Well, you know, it's that's uh, interesting you brought that up because um, I have an orthodontic uh, business partner that we've practiced together 20 years, and she's a numbers cruncher. And uh, she had to be convinced, uh, not just from the gut, but on black and white and, and print, that uh, Invisalign in particular was more profitable. Mm-hmm. So we pulled numerous records and looked at how many appointments what our fees were, and the profitability. And with our appointment intervals, uh, Invisalign was twice as profitable as yep. fixed appliances. Wow. Uh, to the tune of uh, if our fixed was uh, $500 a visit, which is still very good. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. That is excellent. We had Invisalign uh, patients uh, double that. Wow. That's that's impressive because I know we have the conversation a lot. It's hard to, you know, doctors see what the lab fee is. They see the check that they're writing every month. It's hard because a lot of the money that you're talking about, you can't really put your finger on it. It's not a check that's coming back to you physically. So it's very hard to actually see it for a lot of doctors. But you you hit it right on the head uh, with the profitability and stuff that we try to teach doctors as well. So that that's awesome. You guys actually sat down and mapped out all the statistics and actually proved to yourselves how much more profitable it actually is by, you know, getting rid of the majority of emergency appointments and, you know, yeah, zero, almost zero emergency appointments. Right. Um, you know, we see the patients, uh, you know, half as many times. Um, and still, uh, if you look at our end results, very high quality orthodontics is is going out of our office. So it's cases that we're very very proud of. So I don't feel that we're we're skimping on um, uh, quality of patient care uh, to do this. Dr. Blevins, I so enjoyed listening to that. I felt like I, I was a listener. Of course, I was a listener. But you know, there's so much wisdom in in how you go about things in terms of looking at your business, crunching the numbers, deciding that there's a, there's a better approach, there's a better mousetrap, we're going to go in a different direction, even though you've been in practice for a number of years. And I just think it's very refreshing that, that you take uh, fresh looks at uh, a situation and, and decide to make a change. So with that, uh, I hope that the listeners out there can 
you know, take that kind of advice, you know, don't be afraid to change and, and move your business forward. Look at ways to be more profitable. That's what this, you know, podcast is all about is talking to people that have insight with regard to these types of uh, subjects. So with that, Dr. Blevins and Brian, we so appreciate it. And thank you for the listeners uh, listening tonight and we will see you in the next podcast. Now, Robert, as long as you call me wise and not old. (laughs) (laughs) So well well said, Uh, I will heed that advice for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, I sure enjoyed that episode, Brian. How about yourself? Well, it's interesting, Robert, because, you know, needless to say, Dr. Blevins is extremely successful. Uh, Her practices are growing like crazy, yet there are still the vast majority of practices out there that don't operate the way she does. And for the listeners out there, guys, I mean, you're listening to somebody that is in the top 1% in the entire country from a production standpoint and the leading Invisalign teen producer in the world. And she runs her business differently though. And that is what, you know, Robert and I on this show talk to you guys, all the listeners out there about is you have to do it differently. I mean, as an example, you know, Robert, Dr. Blevins turned down, a company proposed a $270,000 external marketing budget or proposal to her organization that has multiple practices, and she turned it down. I'm sure that was difficult because so many businesses want to address top line activities, top line being external marketing activities where they need to be optimizing their bottom line activities, where which is where the profit is. And what's, what's unique about her is that she realized that. And yeah, I was very interested to hear the numbers of what actually happened after she turned that down and then what, what ended up occurring with your company. Well, and, and for the listeners out there, you know, it's, it's a mindset change to understand, again, that everything is marketing. So because she turned down, Robert, the external marketing proposal, she still is doing a huge internal marketing you know, from a, a standpoint, it's just she's focusing on culture and staff and constantly reinvesting in her people. And you know, the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, in 2017, uh, her Invisalign business grew 30% for somebody that's already really good, grew another 30%. And kudos to her because she is always trying to find a way to get better. And her revenue grew 60% in one year. And there is no external marketing on the planet that can ever come close to that type of growth. And it's just so, so much passion for listeners out there. You've got to do it the way a Dr. Blevins does it and view your business the way she views it. Well, I couldn't agree more. You know, that's um, a lot of what our company is about is helping people with their bottom line activities and automating many of those processes. And and you've been preaching that forever uh, with your new patient group company as well. So, I mean, this is just right up our alley. It's right up the alley and, you know, she is a consumer driven person. Uh, I mean, it, it's amazing. You know, she was able to revamp her new patient experience and get people started day one. And, you know, the, the days for listeners out there, if you have an orthodontic practice that thinks you can have a two or more new patient consult to get people started, you will become, and you really already are a dinosaur in the industry. It has to be, if the only thing you ever change about your orthodontic practice is to go to a one appointment new patient consult, get everything done in a timely fashion, you will skyrocket your growth. It cannot be two or more appointments. You will die in today's society and tomorrow's future with what consumers are demanding. It has to be one appointment. And she did it. And and props to her and and the, the numbers speak for themselves. Yes, because there's no barriers to the consumer. And as more consumers are exposed to a one appointment experience at a, at a, say, an orthodontist practice, the other orthodontists who are doing it the other way are going to be competing against a lower barrier to entry, simpler process for the consumer. And the consumer is going to gravitate toward that. It's a great point. I mean, where would you, if you went to three different orthodontists and two of them had multiple appointments to get you started, and then you went to the third one and they said, ah, we're going to scan you, give you a great experience, show you around the place and present you money in an affordable way, and you can get everything going starting today, uh, who are you going to pick? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious, yet there's still so many out there that just, for whatever reason, can't get it through their head that they need to go to that one patient, uh, new patient consult. Well, good stuff. Uh, I think that this was a just a phenomenal episode, and it's, it's a great example of what we talked about in the first episode 
where we're talking about how to run the business different, take a look at things a little bit differently, and then implement those things into the into the way the business runs. So this was a, a great example of that, and we're looking forward to uh, the next episode. Sounds good. I am too. Goodbye, listeners. We'll talk to all of you soon.